yeah. been through research experiences. You're going to see some of that in just the kind of courses that you see. The main thing being, though, to take advantage of all the resources we have, TA hours, faculty member contacts, get to know all of us, learning more about the program, take advantage of advising, take advantage of supplemental instruction, all those kinds of things. It's only going to work if you kind of lean into those experiences, jump into that pool, take advantage of the sea of resources around you, like I said. We're going to start you off and keep this brief. We're going to start you off with these shirts that are available to all of you for free. They have a theme to them. So I'm going to give you a little bio test right away because you're all bio majors. <laughs> you all know about taxonomy. You know about kingdom, fire, all those things. Inside that taxonomy is something called a family. As you look at these shirts, green ones, the green one here, blue ones, tan, pink. There's a unifying theme. And that unifying theme is your chance now to jump in or not jump in. The unifying, the unifying theme is family, because when you join bio, you join a family. If you think that's silly, that's fine. Or <laughs> jump in, because you jump in on this, you get the most out of it. Jump into these new shirts, jump into what's going to come next. It's going to be amazing. Glad to see you all. Always come see any of us for help. I'm in the main office in McGowan North. Email me, come see me. I can always help you. Anything you do at any time, we got you. I came here 22 years ago. Dr. Dean sitting right there. I was a new professor. I was kind of scared. I wasn't sure what to do with some teaching. Dr. Dean would always say, we got you. Stay with me 22 years later. We got you. We got you on anything that comes up. Just let us help you. We always will. Welcome. Look forward to what's next. That's it. Get your shirts later. Jump in. All right. <laughs> so first, I'm going to give a number of the research faculty an opportunity to introduce themselves. They'll talk a little bit about the classes they teach, talk a little bit about what's going on in their labs as well. Uh, so Dr. Deary is with us on Zoom today. Yeah, hopefully you can hear me, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Thank you. So, sorry, I, I, I can't be down there in person. Um, I am an evolutionary biologist. Um, here, I've been at DePaul since 2009, um, and um, my uh, area of specialty is uh, freshwater fish, so I primarily study freshwater fish. In my lab, we're interested in um, how organisms diversify in nature and how they adapt uh, to different or changing environmental conditions. Uh, most of you probably know that humans are having a huge impact on the planet, so uh, we're becoming increasingly interested in how uh, how species in nature respond uh, to the effects, to the transformations of, of the habitat that we, um, that we human beings are causing. Um, and uh, in the lab, we use uh, different types of methods depending on the question. So, but the two major fields are, um, we do DNA sequencing. So if you're interested in research and want to learn about DNA sequencing, uh, we do traditional Sanger sequencing, and we're increasingly trying to use next generation genomic methods um, including nanopore sequencing. So you know, we do that. And then we also study morphological variation. We try to understand differences in form, in body form, or in the skeleton using um, geometric morphometric methods, uh, methods to model how shape varies and, and to be able to, to uh, synthesize that efficiently. Um, next slide. I teach a whole bunch of classes. So this year, right now, I'm teaching evolution, uh, about 235 which comes with a lab. So, you know, we make things evolve. Uh, we don't, but um, <laughs> we study evolution um, and uh, biostatistics. And I'll be teaching uh, biostatistics again in the winter quarter. Um, I also teach general biology, um, the second part of the second section on evolution, uh, concepts in evolution, molecular methods in evolution. So we have concepts coming up in the spring, um, a non-majors class called evolution and health and medicine. And next slide. And, um, and so we have a, a study abroad program that, that runs with um, Stan Cohn, former chair of the Department of Biology, um, called Galapagos Evolution and Society, where we take classes in the spring on evolution and society, the implications of evolution and society, and on um, the natural history of the Galapagos Islands. And then we go to Ecuador um, for two weeks, and we'll spend a few days in the mainland and then go to Galapagos for a week. Um, and, um, and, you know, kind of learn about evolution by seeing the things that the organisms and the islands and the geological landscapes that famous evolutionary bi biologists saw and inspired the theory. 
Um, so that is um, that is in the spring. So if you're interested, the application will be in February. Last slide. So uh, special, you know, special skills. So if you speak Spanish, I'm always interested in students that know Spanish and are interested in ecology, evolution, or computational biology. Uh, most of what I've published is in English. I still live in the U.S., but um, increasingly I'm trying to publish in Spanish to make the work we do accessible to people that don't speak English. So if you're a Spanish speaker, uh, you can always use you know your help reading and and writing in Spanish. Thanks. Thank you very much. So we've got a number of faculty with us here today as well. Margaret Bell, if you'd like to come up. And then what I'll ask you guys to do that are here, as long as the person who is after you is also here, is just uh, do ping pong to the next. We can do that. OK. Yeah. Hi, everybody. I'm Dr. Margaret Bell. Um, these are some folks that are in the lab. All right. Yeah, there's Carissa. It's Carissa right there, number two. There's Gia and Jennifer and Catalina and Matt and Mahmoud. So we um, we study neuroendocrinology, but even more acronymy than that is neuroimmunoendocrinology. So it's kind of this cool intersection between what's happening in the brain and how it's happening in the brain is dependent on and responsive to and interacting with other systems that are throughout our body in a more physiological approach. So our immune systems and our endocrine systems that are responding to our environment chatting with our brain and there's a whole bunch of positive um, feedback within that. Um, we use a, an animal model to understand that. Our rat brains are pretty similar to human brains, all solid mammals. Um, and the approaches that we take are a little bit of toxicology, a little bit of um, in, uh, molecular approaches, cellular approaches, behavioral approaches. Um, so we are studying uh, behaviors that we think are applicable to mood and affect, how we're feeling, positive, negative feelings and social interactions. Um, I'm particularly interested in adolescence as an important developmental period where a lot of that stuff comes on board. Um, so behavior stuff, cell culture stuff, molecular gene expression stuff. Um, so throwing a lot of pieces together. The classes that I teach, you'll see parallels there. So I teach cell biology, I'm teaching that right now. I teach that about once a year. Um, I also teach a course called The Physiology of Poverty. It's really about how structural inequities within our society get under our skin. Um, it's cross-listed now as a Bio 225 and a Health 325. The prereqs are pretty minimal for that, so um, that should be accessible. I think it's a good way to apply what you're getting in bio to a bigger social concept, right, which is a, a skill that we all need to work on. Um, brain and behavior from non-majors and endocrinology. Um, endo is great for um, thinking about big physiology. Nobody talks about endocrinology, but it's how we respond to stressors, how we respond to food, um, sex differences, not the same, but interacting with gender differences. Um, so I really like thinking about how what's happening, molecular, cellular levels relate to our broader world. I'm happy to chat, take questions. My office is in room 122 in McGowan North. So feel free to say hi if you see me in the hall. Thank you. Hi everyone, it's good to see such a good turnout today. So my name is Dr. Brooke. I am an infectious disease specialist by research training. I'm a microbiologist and you can see the number of courses I teach up here this year. So I'm teaching microbiology in the fall. I'm gonna be teaching principles of biotech in the winter. And in the spring, I'm gonna be teaching topics in microbiology and biotech, along with a new course that we're going to be teaching Dr. Screnti and I will be co-teaching a new cure course in the winter quarter called Advanced Microbiology. So if you're one of those individuals who goes through Bio 210 Microbiology, discovers a passion for it, this course is for you. We're going to be doing small group research projects. So this is going to be very, very cool to start up and running. So Dr. Screnti and I will be co-teaching that. In terms of my research, I am an infectious disease person. So primarily my research is focused around a bacterium that is infectious to humans. It is a global opportunist. It is also multi-drug resistant. So it causes things like infections in human eyes, such as respiratory tract infections and bloodstream infections. It is fatal, particularly for those that are immunocompromised. So one of the reasons we're working on it is the antibiotic resistance of the organism is rising steadily. 
So the challenge is becoming how do we treat people with this type of infection? So we're looking for alternative strategies other than using antibiotics to treat and prevent infections by this pathogen. I'm always looking for undergraduate students to help. So if you're interested, contact me by email. This I put up to show you. The undergraduate students who have worked in my lab have published with me. So I know the importance of publishing. They've also presented posters at various conferences, including things like our annual science showcase. So with that, I'm gonna pass it on to the next person, Dr. Bistriansky. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah. <laughs> All right, that's a good, good response. Thanks, Dr. Brooke. Uh, my name is Jason Bistriansky. I'm an associate professor here in bio. I'm not in the room right now, but I'm coming to you via Zoom uh, to tell you a little bit about who I am and what I do. Um, I'm trained as a marine biologist and as an animal physiologist. So you'll see my list of courses there include things like marine biology for non-majors and a couple of different physiology classes that we offer here at DePaul. So at Animal Phys, Bio 307, which I'm teaching now in the fall and in the springtime advanced comparative physiology, which is essentially how different animals are adapted to live in more extreme environments and how their physiology is involved. Um, I also teach uh, a study abroad program with Dr. Kyle Bryce in the south of Spain. Uh, we've been teaching it for about four years or five years now. And essentially this is a, uh, an opportunity for students with without research experience to learn about what research is. And it's kind of like a research boot camp. In two weeks, you'll pull off your own uh, novel experiment within a group of students. And we've had great success over the years of students learning about research and actually publishing some of their work. And so uh, I invite you to contact me if you're interested in research uh, related to the study abroad program. Uh, but also if you're interested in my research in general, uh, I do have some uh, spaces for students coming up. I think I have another slide, right? Somebody can. Yeah. So my research in particular, um, I look at how the environment can challenge animals to uh, acclimate under different circumstances. And the main uh, model that I use are fishes that are able to tolerate changing environmental salinity. So these could be species that live in a place where the salinity fluctuates, like an estuary, or perhaps a species that migrates between environments with varying salinity. So I have the example here of the life cycle of a salmon. This is kind of one of my model groups that I look at. You may know that salmon are, you know, amazing uh, group of fish that can uh, tolerate uh, a change from their freshwater habitat as juveniles go into the ocean as adults and then return again. And so I study how they're able to balance the salt and water in their body, um, especially during those transition phases from one to the next and how that affects survival and uh, success. So welcome everyone to the department. Um, I hope you um, uh, seek out all the opportunities that are available to you. Please feel free to contact me if you have any questions about teaching or my research program. Thanks. Um, so our next faculty member who is not able to join us today is Dr. Sarah Connolly, who is a virologist and microbiologist, and she focuses primarily on study of viral entry into host cells. Um, so she's involved with teaching, not surprisingly, microbiology. She also teaches um, several courses in the health sciences department, and she's also one of the major instructors for the first quarter of general biology, Bio 181. Um, she looks specifically at the class of viruses called herpes viruses and the receptors on the host cell membrane that these viruses use to basically force their way into the cell and then ultimately fuse with that cell membrane and inject their genetic material into the cell for replication. Uh, so she's studying primarily the entry step of this viral life cycle. And She's really got a great respect for viruses, as many of us have a newfound respect for viruses in the last couple of years. Um, so Dr. Connolly has been very involved with DePaul's outreach during the um, COVID years in terms of you know, news organizations in the area and uh, being involved with panels on campus, making sure people are up to date with the latest information. There, sorry, I 
I thought she had another slide, but I apologize. Um, so if you guys are interested in virology, if you're interested in uh, microbiology, she's another great person to talk to, and I would encourage you to reach out. Um, I'm just going to mute this for a quick moment because I noticed that the Dean of our College, Dr. Dan Barnes, who is also on the biology faculty, joined us today, but I don't have any slides on her behalf, so would you like to come up and just say a few words? Yeah. And I was just speaking in. Yes. <laughs> hey, everybody. Uh, so um, I'm Stephanie Vance Barnes, and yes, I'm the Dean of the College of Science and Health that you're all a part of. I'm actually coming from a few other events. One is a research based event um, where we're talking about partnerships with Rosalind Franklin and different. Um, uh, opportunities as it relates to research with them and so I'm really excited in the space of AI and you know big data mining and so I think that will mean more opportunities and funding for, for you all and um, I'm so excited about what we're doing here which is introducing you to the interests of the various faculty in the department and hopefully you'll find the area that you have an affinity for and you can't go wrong with any of the wonderful faculty um, my particular research area is cancer biology. Um, for several years, I worked in the area of lung cancer. And then during my postdoctoral work, I shifted to breast cancer, um, predominantly with triple negative breast, breast cancer. I did a lot of bioinformatics, um, mainly around um, attempting to um, uh, do uh, identify more strategies for targeted therapies and also thinking about how we can begin to do more types of predictive prognostic, prognostic type of activities with um, different forms and subtypes of breast cancer. And so um, I haven't had a whole lot of time to get into the lab the past two years, but I am working on bringing my lab here and so hopefully I'll have the space and some opportunities to engage with you all a bit more. Um, additionally, I do do a lot of work with how we're promoting STEM and engaging particularly underrepresented um, populations with, to STEM and um, um, improving their science efficacy. And so I'm excited to be a part of this journey with you all. And once again, um, you couldn't be working with a better faculty um, here at DePaul and within the Department of Biology. And thank you for giving me a few minutes to introduce myself. And Tim, thank you for your leadership within the department. You guys have a great day. I'm going to catch a flight that I have. <laughs> Just typifies our faculty. Always very busy, but always still making the time for their students. All right, so next up is Dr. John Dean. Thank you. So I'm Dr. Dean. Um, I am a plant biologist, and I've been here for quite a while, but I've seen a lot of changes. Uh, you have a lot of great faculty. Um, I've, been very happy and very pleased being here at DePaul. It's a, it's a fabulous place, and I'd love to see the next generation of students coming through. Any of my Bio 191 students here from my class? Yeah? How's it going? Yeah, you're my new favorite student for today. You get double secret bonus points. So just make a note of that. It does not help your grade. And you get a free shirt. So these are some of the courses that I teach. I'm teaching general biology. You might see me again in Bio 193. I co-teach with uh, Dr. Bistriansky. Uh, I'm the plant guy, so I teach the plant portion. He's the animal guy, so he teaches the animal portion. Uh, I do teach plant physiology. That'll be offered in the winter. Uh, I think cell biology is the prerequisite for that. Um, I am, in terms of research, I call myself a plant biologist, but I think I'm more of a chemist. I, I, I love the chemistry of plants. I think they are the most remarkable chemical organisms on the planet. Some of the things that they make are absolutely astounding. And if you think about how humans have been able to exploit some of these things like uh, THC, all the cocaine, uh, opioid derivatives, uh, <laughs> nicotine, caffeine, I mean, uh, the salicylic acid, which is the basis for asthma. I mean, these are remarkable chemicals that plants are making to ward off insects. They're organisms rooted in place. 
they make food, everything wants to eat them, uh, and they have to fight the, those, some of those, those pathogens and insects off, mostly insects. So they develop over the course of evolution these amazing, remarkable chemicals that I'm very interested in. A lot of people want to know why I'm not interested in the medicinal value of them, because there is medicinal value in them. I'm not. I'm more interested in how plants use them to defend themselves. So here's uh, some work that we've done over the years. This is salicylic acid. Uh, we've been working on how salicylic acid, which is the, the basis of aspirin, uh, the most successful over-the-counter drug in the history of medicine. Uh, it's made in a plant compound, but it's, it's as a plant compound, but it's also a plant defense hormone. So we're interested in how it's made, how it's stored, how it's biochemically um, manipulated within the cell. Um, my lab uses a lot of techniques that, that span a variety of different things. We do a lot of HPLC. Uh, we do some immunology uh, or generating, not immunology, but we generate antibodies to, uh, to, to find certain membrane fractions. Uh, we do some molecular biology, cell biology, so a host of range of things, a lot of biochemistry. So if you're interested in biochemistry, uh, this is an opportunity to get involved in an organism that has a fascinating biochemistry. This is some of the things that we're most interested in right now. I've kind of shifted my research a little bit. We're interested in some pigment compounds. Uh, these are cyanidins. Uh, they're actually the red and purple pigments that you see. So the red color of wine, these are anthocyanins, purple color of grapes. These attract pollinators and seed dispersers. And again, we're interested in how they're made, how they're stored in the cell, uh, and how the plant uses them for some of those uh, ecological purposes. So anyway, welcome to Nepal, and uh, I hope I get a chance to talk more with you later. So thank you. Likewise, standing in for Dr. Phil Funk, who is unable to join us today. Um, he is our resident immunologist, and he studies specifically how certain cell signaling pathways lead to the decision of an immune cell either to survive and continue circulation or to die. Um, and these decisions are really important, both in terms of normal immune system function and preventing autoimmune responses, as well as in regulating the normal turnover of blood cells so you don't develop things like blood cancers. Um, and specifically, he's been looking at certain interacting domains in these proteins and how they um, regulate that, those signaling pathways. And this is just showing you one of his students who presented at a conference, some of the recent work just shows um, students are getting out there and getting their research um, No. Okay, Dr. Gillum. Hello, everyone. My name is Bill Gilliland. Uh, to, I am a geneticist by training, and I work on the fruit fly Drosophila melanogaster. Uh, to start with the courses I'm teaching, this quarter I am teaching Gen Bio, uh, Bio 191, are any of my students here? Oh, I'm very glad to see you all. Thank you. Um, I also teach uh, a course required for all bio majors, Genetics, Bio 260, um, and uh, a non-majors class in the freshman sequence on cloning and biotechnology. Um, and I have a new class uh, that I'm teaching this spring called Advanced Genetic Analysis. This is a CURE class, course-based undergraduate research experience. Uh, DePaul has joined a consortium called the Genomics Education Partnership. This is a group of about 100 institutions around the country. A central lab generates whole genome sequence data for new species and then parcels this out for the process of annotation. It turns out at this point, getting the DNA sequence of a genome is really easy. It's annotating it, marking where all the genes are, where they begin and end, the intron exon boundaries, et cetera. In this class, Students are given a contig, a chunk of DNA, about 40,000 nucleotides, and this has never been analyzed by anyone. And so we go through, we find where all the genes are, we identify the start and stop positions of them, as well as the splicing isoforms, and then this data is returned to the consortium to be compiled into peer-reviewed published manuscripts. The GEP has published papers with upwards of 400 co-authors, because the rule in Drosophila is, if your data is in the paper, your name's on the paper. And so undergraduates completing this course can, with a little extracurricular work uh, down the road when the paper's ready, be co-authors on peer-reviewed published manuscripts. Um, I also teach a graduate student class that uh, I see several of the people in here, uh, Bio 494. And I don't remember if, uh, ah, 
Yes, okay. Uh, it's been a while since I looked at these slides. So here is my, uh, my model organism, the fruit fly Drosophila melanogaster. The markings at the top are millimeters. So these are tiny, tiny little fruit flies. Uh, this is a female. You can see, I don't have a pointer of any kind, um, but you can see coming out the tip of her abdomen, this little white football, that is an egg. And her abdomen is about 50% ovaries. And uh, these eggs, when you look at them very close, uh, they have a, uh, they're about a half a millimeter long. And uh, the little black box at the top is blown up here. Those are the chromosomes. Uh, Drosophila are basically chromosomes with wings. And they have four chromosomes. And we can figure out which ones they are by their shape. And so my question is, how do you go from the two copies of every chromosome to the one copy in the gamete that you need to make the next organism. So I'm interested in what genes are involved, what do they do, and how do the steps of that work? And I think that's my left. Yeah, so I just have the, uh, the final slide. Um, DePaul has a very powerful microscope called a confocal. Uh, I'm the director of the confocal facility, and I use it extensively in my lab. That's how we got these pictures here. Um, and it is a way to pair the genetic analysis, looking at the, the progeny of the crosses, with what their cells are doing cytologically. So that's the main thrust of my research focus. Okay. I think that's my last so This is Dr. Dorothy Kozlowski. She's likewise unable to join us today, but sends her regrets. Um, she is a neuroscientist and she studies primarily the impacts of traumatic brain injury. Um, she teaches a number of courses in the neuroscience department as well as in biology, including both behavioral and cognitive neurosciences. Um, and she's also teaching some non-majors classes like a focal point brain behavior. And she's one of the many instructors involved in biostats. Um, so her lab looks primarily at this two hit hypothesis, the idea that repeat concussions can have significantly greater impacts on things like brain health, susceptibility to neurogenitive disease than a single hit. Um, so looking at whether there's certain um, changes that happen in the brain after a second concussion that are very different from what happens after just a first, and whether there are any genetic risk factors that make someone more vulnerable to them developing other conditions down the road, and specifically also whether the immune system, whether the microglia in the brain have a role in those impacts as well. Okay. Um, Dr. Lamantine also couldn't join us, but I'm going to get out of here for a second because she did send an audio version of her slide, so you get to hear her voice instead of mine. I'm Dr. Jolene Lamontane. I'm a professor here in the Department of Biological Sciences, and I also have some affiliations with other research institutes in, in the Chicago area, including the Morton Arboretum and the Urban Wildlife Institute at the Lincoln Park Zoo. In terms of the classes that I teach, I teach ecology in the fall, and in the winter this year I'll be teaching introductory biology, the ecology and evolution course. Um, I also teach some other classes. So one is a research methods and applied biostatistics course where we analyze real data sets using a computer software program called R. And I also teach population ecology. I am a population ecologist. That means I'm interested in how and why population sizes and populations do different things in different areas. One of the things that my lab studies is this phenomenon called mast seeding. So most years for actually most species of trees, they don't produce very many seeds. And then every once in a while, they would just produce massive amounts of seeds. Um, this is white spruce, so new cones on the left and some old cones um, after they've released the seeds on the right. And, and you can just see that this tree is covered in these brown cones, so many that we can actually detect them from satellite imagery. Uh, we go and do a lot of field work in my lab, which means we go and count cones on trees. And uh, here's a, a former grad student of mine um, with a computer in the field downloading data from a data logger that records temperature information for us. Um, it records it every two hours, and we've been recording this data now for about a dozen years. I'm interested in variation from why are two individuals within the same population similar or different in their patterns of reproduction? 
up to you know, local populations are they similar or different up to continental and global scales and so this is just showing uh, a figure from a recent paper showing that these mast events where there's just tons of cones on these trees can occur regionally uh, at a subcontinental scale um, but not in, in other parts and this has huge implications for tree regeneration what's the fate of the future forests and for species that that feed on these seeds so for instance here's a, a bird and it actually has a spruce seed in its mouth small mammals also eat these seeds um, and mast seeding as a phenomenon has been linked to uh, increases in Lyme disease when there's lots of seeds you have lots of small mammals and, and deer uh, populations if you're in areas where there's lots of acorns and oaks um, and then you have higher outbreaks of of Lyme disease. And so in my lab, not only do we study reproduction of trees, but we also study these consumer resource dynamics. I also do some global change biology research, including climate change. So I work at a Oak Ridge National Lab site uh, where we've been working now since 2017, collecting data on tree reproduction. So there's actually these environmental chambers manipulate temperature and carbon dioxide, and it's out in the forest. You can see that there's full size trees in here. And, and my lab also does some urban ecology work as well. And so we're interested in how across different habitats within the city, comparing forest preserves and city parks, uh, residential areas and cemeteries, uh, what's the difference in availability of tree cavities. So which, some of which are made by woodpeckers, others just occur naturally. And then how does that influence their populations? So thank you so much. Real quickly, sorry, sure. until the other one that you want to get to call out their students. Um, for mine that are meeting with me at 2 40, we're going to be doing more views. So if you wanted to stay for the remainder of the week, you're welcome to. Um, you will be missing any kind of material there. So. Do you want to introduce yourself briefly while you're I still here? So, um, I am in the department. Um, I teach many of the neuroscience courses. That's my background. So, behavioral neuroscience, cognitive neuroscience. I'll probably see quite a few of you in biostats. Um, and, of course, bio many ones. So, I think I have a slide for you, but <laughs> just was later on. <laughs> yeah, all that stuff. So, she looks like behind the mask. All right. Thanks so much, everybody. <laughs> So I think I'm most impressed with uh, Dr. Martino. Um, over the years when we do this, there's always different faculty that are missing. So I think you've given everybody's introduction for them at some point over <laughs> in great detail. It's pretty nice. Uh, okay, what's up, Blue Demons? I'm um, Dr. Nordstrom. Uh, you, might, you might know me from such classes as <laughs> cellular neurobiology and, um, and the other ones. Listed up there. Most of my time I'm, I'm doing spending uh, human anatomy and cell neuro, and I have some, um, teaching reductions for some administrative work that I do. Uh, by training, I'm a neurobiologist and um, my interest is in neurodegeneration. So uh, I'm interested in um, diseases like Alzheimer's disease. So if, if everyone in this room lives long enough, about half of us will get some kind of Alzheimer's or related dementia. Uh, so it's a, it's a big, um, it's a problem. It's a societal problem and a scientific uh, uh, problem uh, to be tackled. And despite uh, years of effort and, and lots of research, um, we're, it seems we're, we're not quite there. <laughs> so um, most of what I do on a day-to-day -day basis is actually cell biology and uh, biochemistry. So I'm interested in, does this have like a little, can you see that? So, oh, okay, I'm gonna use this to, um, so if you look in, uh, this is like a, a sagittal view uh, of, a, of a, or a lateral view of the brain. And if you look in the patients of people who suffer from Alzheimer's um, and you stay in the brain in a particular way, what you see is that it's riddled with these types of, um, this type of pathology called plaques. And there's another related pathology as well. Um, but genetic evidence really points to, um, so everyone, at every genetic instance of Alzheimer's, there are specific genes that if they're mutated, there's a 100% chance that you'll get Alzheimer's, sometimes very early, very young. Um, and every mutation affects the, the generation of these plaques. So there's a lot of interest in the protein that leads to 
uh, the generation of the constituents of these plaques, which is actually a, a very small peptide that happens to be really sticky. Um, now, the whole story of Alzheimer's, which is kind of like a cognitive uh, whole, whole brain disease, is much more complicated than just the, the gumming up of the tissue with these plaques. But um, because the, the, the genesis, the, the spark that lights this fire um, seems to be uh, these peptides, which are then generated from this larger protein, I'm interested in this larger protein. It's called the amyloid precursor protein. So most of my work has to do with finding out the, the cell biology of this protein, where in the cell it spends its time and for how long and who it interacts with, what other proteins it interacts with and what we can learn about that so that um, you could inform effective strategies for changing the, the uh, generation of these, of these plaques. Yeah, so I do a lot of cell biology, protein biochemistry, um, and, and that sort of thing. And, and that's it, that's me. And also I just wanna say, I've never seen a rainbow shirt in any of my classes and I'm so stoked that there's somebody with a rainbow shirt. <laughs> uh, most of you probably don't understand what we're talking about, but a rainbow fans too, so. Um, so uh, anyway, thank you. Sorry, that was a weird idea. Yeah. Yes, the band. <laughs> Dr. Shimano was back and forth about whether he was going to be able to make it today, but ended up he had to be traveling. Um, but he is our resident paleontologist. He does primarily comparative vertebrate anatomy and paleontology, looking a lot at chondrichthians, so sharks and relatives. Um, he does a lot of field work as well, digging up fossils, and he uses collections that he's been involved in coordinating and also museum collections, um, both locally and nationally. Um, and his students get access to these specimens for their research. And he teaches the second quarter of general biology, um, the evolution portion primarily, and also a number of anatomy and paleontology, paleobiology courses. Um, I'm guessing the animal diversity one is new. Is that one? <laughs> Silent and red. Um, so if you're interested in digging up fossils, I was had the, the pleasure of um, watching my girls dig up a bone while we were hiking in Rocky Mountain National Park this summer. And I was like, I should talk to Dr. Shimada in 15 years. <laughs> All right, Dr. Sarms. <clears throat> So hi again. So um, it's my name Tim Sparks. So I do uh, from the UK originally. My background is kind of uh, marine biology, aquatic biology as undergrad. My grad school did more general evolutionary ecology and aquatic systems. Last few years I've moved over into host parasite um, relationships. So I do a lot of the kind of um, if you have seen the news stories about the parasites that take over control of the hosts and turn them into zombies. I would not talk about that stuff. Uh, just about neuroscience, behavioral ecology kind of stuff. Started off in Papico, population ecology, Dr. Lamontagne, moved over to behavioral ecology, and then. When I came to Chicago in 2000, started working on this host parasite relationships, which we have some very local, um, very local, some local systems that have some uh, very well studied host parasite relationships that are well known throughout the field that we do get to do some very um, cool research around that stuff. Teach biostats, Gen Bio 2, I teach Bio 192, so I likely see some of you winter quarter or spring quarter. I teach both those quarters. December, this picture was taken down in South Carolina, just like Dr. Bispriancy. I teach a marine biology class. Uh, in the December session, which people often don't know about, there's a short December session. You can take an entire course in three weeks, which means it's 10 weeks in three weeks. We do about uh, five days on campus, then we go to South Carolina for nine days, live in a field station, and get a full immersion experience where basically you're up early, you're out in the field, we're designing projects, collecting data, uh, presenting at night, next day, do a beach, do it again, next day, salt marsh, do it again. Carries into the winter quarter. This is one of the images from down there. You're out grabbing fish out of the ocean. You're working with Department of Natural Resource guys. You're getting a real visceral experience of what that kind of uh, research exposure is like. So that kind of is one of these, again, these cure courses. It's this course-based undergraduate research experience where you really get to feel how that kind of thing works. And we often talk about the way we teach science and the way we do science aren't always exactly the same. These research experiences really give you a very good sense. Okay, this is how this stuff works. This is how we learn stuff. So we put these things together. So those are there. Uh, I teach a on class for later on as well. I also teach a behavioral parasitology class, which is not up here, for a 300-level class. So there's another slide. 
Thanks. Nope, nope that was not me. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that was it. So one to cover just around research. So you're seeing a lot of these presentations, and sometimes it can be a bit intimidating to think about how can you see yourself doing the research. But the reality is, everything you're going to need to get to this transitionary space is going to be provided. The Jam Bio sequence is going to give you this whole range of experiences. You're going to learn more about the research. Dr. Martino has created these really interesting workshops in Bio 193. You'll get to learn more about how to get involved in research, what kind of options there might be. You go through the software sequence and really strengthen those uh, different skill sets. So by the time you're moving into these research spaces, you're fully prepared for that transition. So if it looks a bit intimidating now, don't sweat it. We're moving you into that space. The challenge is always, I first got involved in research as an undergrad taking a class, one of these pure star classes. But secretly, I was always a researcher because I spent my summers at the beach and just wander around the beach, flipping rocks, being like, why is this fish this color? Why is this crab this color? So I was always fascinated by research, found it amazing, good way to get involved, and that's never gone away. And that's always one of the challenges, getting into research and staying in that space where you just love it and you want to be involved in it, more from it all the time, will get you to the place where you can always do those kinds of things. So whenever you get a chance to step into research and those opportunities come available to you, take advantage of it, lean into it, and you get the most out of this whole experience. All right, thank you. <laughs> so, lest you worry that I don't know my alphabet, I knew Dr. Kip was going to be arriving late, so that's why I changed it after S. Well, thank you. I'm so glad I got here in time to <laughs> make the introduction about myself. So, uh, you can see my name here. I'm Jing Jing Kip, and uh, I'm a physiologist and a reproductive biologist uh, in the department. Uh, I got my PhD. Uh, in physiology from U of I uh, many years ago, and then uh, did a postdoc training uh, in Northwestern and focusing on ovary development. Uh, so my lab is more like a molecular endocrinology lab. So this slides list the uh, courses I teach. You can see it's a very much physiology heavy um, list. Uh, you know, I teach, uh, it's an SI course, uh, how the human body works, and my reproduction is a, a course uh, for senior bio major and graduate students. Uh, it's a seminar uh, based course, it's always been popular. And I also teach human physiology and also capstone. And of course, I have taught some other different kinds of courses as well. So, you know, probably throughout your, your, your school years, you're probably going to take at least one of my courses along the way. Uh, so in terms of research, as I mentioned that uh, uh, my lab is a molecular endocrinology lab. Uh, we study hormonal signaling and gene regulation in the ovary development. Uh, we know that uh, there are a lot of uh, situations that may affect our society and uh, human health. Uh, world population is growing uh, uh, tremendously and uh, come with that, there's poverty, pollution, this kind of thing. So there's a need for, you know, uh, uh, fertility control and also a uh, lot of people, a uh, lot of couples are infertile because uh, uh, some different kind of uh, underlying diseases and they desperately uh, want to have their own children. And uh, meanwhile, there are some diseases like ovarian cancer, premature ovarian failure, uh, or polycystic ovarian syndrome. Uh, all these diseases are affecting a lot of uh, uh, population in our society. So we try to figure out the mechanism uh, at the molecular level, cellular level, and also tissue and organ level to see what, what's the underlying uh, you know, genes or signal pathways may regulate. Uh, this kind of process leads to this kind of uh, lead to final uh, prevention and uh, treatment of these kind of diseases. Uh, so I have one more slide. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, so we use a variety of uh, uh, means to uh, to address our research questions. So I like we use uh, uh, mice uh, as an animal model. So currently we have uh, I don't know like uh, we have uh, I cook. Chairs here, we have uh, four or five different uh, transgenic uh, lines going on. We try to make our own conditional knockout, and we're making really good progress. It's a long process, <laughs> but uh, we're getting to the stage that uh, we start to see some fruits there. And uh, uh, we also do histology, morphology, a uh, lot of molecular biology research. Um, um, we also do some cell signaling uh, or imaging. Uh, stuff. So if you're interested, this is my email. Uh, you probably can find from a bio website as well. Uh, 
All right, glad to see you all here. Thank you. <laughs> So in addition to all the faculty that have research opportunities in their labs and active research programs in the fall, there's also a number of us that are primarily spending our time in the classroom. Um, so there's a couple of us that are coordinating labs for the really big lab courses, and then a couple of us that are involved in teaching mostly smaller courses. Um, I had the luck of being immortalized a few years ago when they were doing a photo shoot for McGowan South. So if you haven't had me in a class yet, that may be why I look familiar. Um, so first of the lab coordinators is Rima Burkowskis. Um, as you can see, she's an athlete. She's done a number of triathlons. Um, so obviously she's interested in physiology and anatomy. And that's a course that she's working on this year. Um, she's also has been involved with cell biology, genetics, bio 193. <coughs> Excuse me, and actually did her research with Dr. Sparks when she was a master's student here at DePaul herself. Um, so there's her contact information as well. Um, I'm sure you will see her around the department during your time here. And then Claire Behrens. I'll let you introduce yourself. Dr. Martino. Um, yeah, so welcome everybody. It's, I see a lot of familiar faces. So you may have seen me, um, I'm coordinating the bio 191 labs this quarter. Gen bio sequence. Um, it's been a lot of fun so far. So I'm glad a lot of you could make it. Um, so yeah, I'm a little bit new to a little bit new to the on sequence. I took over for Dr. Martino this quarter. Um, but it's been been going great so far. And I'll actually be doing 191 on winter quarter as well. And I always make the joke, I hope I don't see see you guys again. <laughs> that's uh, that's all right too. We'll we'll have fun again. Um, and then in the spring, um, I'll be uh, Courtney 192, and it's exciting. This year, I'm actually going to be lecturing 192 for the first time, uh, co-teaching with, I think, our chair over there, Dr. Sparks. Um, so I'm really excited for that. I've been working on my lecture, so I'm, I'm excited. Um, and then I'll also be uh, teaching um, three co-teaching with um, Dr. Park, um, Rima Barkowskis um, in the spring 302. So this is a kind of um, teaching teaching students how to teach science. So it's an experiential learning course. So I'm really excited about that. Um, and I was actually in the lab of Liam Heenahan. Um, I got my master's here at DePaul and I studied um, how uh, plant diversity above ground affects the diversity of microarthropods in soil. So if that is something that interests you. Um, we looked at a number of um, plots around Chicago wilderness. I'd be happy to talk to you about that. It was a really cool uh, research study. And um, yeah, I miss, I miss research a little bit. So, um, yeah, there's my contact information. I threw up a few um, fun photos up there. I've got a family photo. Um, those two little ones take up a lot of my time. I've got a, a one-year-old and a four-year-old right now. Um, so they're they're a lot of a lot of energy. They keep me keep me going. And then my two cats. They those are the only two people that two creatures that wish we were still um, in the pandemic and wish I was at home <laughs> in my basement on the computer. <laughs> but, um, okay, well, um, it's good to see everybody. I hope to see you in lab soon or in uh, lecture. Thank you. Now I get to introduce myself, Dr. Martino. This is Dr. Martino. <laughs> um, I have taught at Biology Paul, let's see, this is my 15th year, um, and I get primarily involved the first several years with the general biology sequence, so coordinating labs for 191, 192, 193, and then lecturing 193. Um, and I'm doing 193 this fall, as well as in the spring, and right now in um, the fall, I'm also doing some team-based learning in 193. So I've gone from being someone who does research in a lab to someone who does research on teaching, um, and I really enjoy learning about the way people learn. Um, the other courses I teach here are one non-majors course on vision art, so how our visual system kind of interfaces with different techniques that artists use and how we perceive the visual arts, and I have taught um, the non-majors general biology with lab before and also have an exercise physiology course. I'm the second of the two athletes in the lab coordinator <laughs> group. I'm not a swimmer, so I've not done any triathlons, but done some marathons in my life. Um, and I also have two kids at home. I have twin daughters, so they're my um, 
personal experiment with nature versus nurture, and I can tell you it's neither one. <laughs> they are polar opposites to each other, despite sharing a lot of genes and growing up in the same household. Uh, and I look forward to hopefully seeing many of you in one of these courses in the future. And then our final lab coordinator, uh, teaching faculty member is Dr. Megan Scrementi, who Dr. Brooke mentioned. Um, she does a lot of collaboration with both in microbiology and with these new courses that are developing to allow students authentic research experiences in the classroom. Um, she's also been involved with both Bio 181 lecture and lab, as well as Bio 183 labs. And she's like Dr. Funk, an immunologist by training. Okay, and then we have some additional teaching faculty. I think I saw Dr. Hudson in the room. I don't know if you want to just say a quick hello, introduce yourself, or if you want to come up and say more, it's up to you. I'm really not ready, so I'll just say <laughs> I'm going to be a lab coordinator for the first time in Bio 192 in the um, winter, so I'm really looking forward to that. Mm -hmm. One category to the next, I suppose. Okay. Uh, do you have any other teaching faculty here that I missed? I don't know if I have a slide for Dr. Pam, but I never got an RSVP from her. But um, um, so Dr. Pam, <coughs> excuse me, also teaches primarily non major courses, but she does um, teach genetics as well. And she's also got a course with the Steen Center where she does like a service learning um, component where students design classes to then teach to Chicago public school students. So that's one that I think even majors, either majors, either majors or non-majors might be interested in in terms of an experiential learning uh, opportunity. And she and Dr. Hudson and several of the other um, teaching faculty also share a joint office space that's off the main biology office. So if you ever want to come talk to any of them, that's where you'll find them. And then Dr. Soderstrom had to make her exit earlier, so you've seen this slide. Okay, and then Dr. Sosa is not here, right? Okay, um, so Dr. Tim Sosa also fairly recently joined the faculty. He's been doing some labs for 193. He teaches ecology. He is teaching the inaugural session of CSH 101 becoming a scientist um, for new STEM majors that are kind of getting oriented to the sciences, oriented to their home departments. Um, and he has a lot of experience teaching at other institutions as well. Um, he's a fantastic artist, by the way. So I don't know if you can see the picture next to him up there, but he's, um, he, that's his own artwork. He's big and vicious. Okay. Yeah. Um, I know we have at least a half a dozen grad students in the room, so I'm going to let you introduce yourselves. We're going to start in this row and just kind of make your way back. They're mostly hanging out in the front here. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm John Duranek. That's me on the right. Um, I'm a grad student in uh, Dr. Shimada's lab. Um, my research is on Nebraska sharks. It was 100 million years ago, there was a seaway that connected from the Arctic Ocean down to Gulf of Mexico, uh, sharks and other fishes could swim up there and they died and fossilized. So I'm looking at the uh, population um, of these sharks. We're going to be comparing it to similar populations uh, that were um, in other states. Hi. Speaking um, of sharks. Yeah. Uh, my nickname is Shark. You can call me Big or Shark. Um, yeah. And um, I'm also in Dr. Shimada's lab. It's my second year here. And I've uh, really been enjoying the uh, faculty. So I just want to break that in. I love all the uh, meeting or the um, speeches we've been seeing so far. And, um, yeah. So looking at, but not so much fossil sharks, but uh, more modern um, comparative morphology of the skull and seeing how that kind of influences their ecology and evolution to kind of tie that into uh, ocean conservation. Hi, I'm Kylie. I'm actually a new grad student here at the fall. I'm in the Lamonte lab, so Julie Lamonte. Um, I'll be working on conifer regeneration. So she talked a little bit about that in her slides, uh, just looking at reproduction of conifer trees versus how many uh, of those are actually, you know, propagating and turning into new trees. Hi, 
Hi guys, um, my name is Lexi and I work in Dr. Raj's research lab. She wasn't, she didn't make a slide I guess and wasn't um, present here, but she is like a cell biologist basically who focuses on like cancer and like breast cancer specifically. So my research is about, um, we're basically looking at gold one chloride compounds um, and we are exposing those to triple negative breast cancer cells. And we're pretty much just examining if these compounds have an effect, like if they, um, decrease like the cell proliferation of these cells and basically hopefully later on like we will see that some of these compounds um, pretty much kill these breast cancer cells and then those will go on to kind of hopefully be a treatment one day but um, if not we're just kind of seeing what um, characteristics of these compounds may or may not influence breast cancer cells so Hi guys, I'm Christian and I'm working in Dr. Aguirre's lab and I'm a new grad student so I'm still searching for a thesis uh, project but in the past I've worked with Dr. Aguirre on, uh, on fish morphometrics in Western Ecuador and I'm hoping to either branch on to into more genomics research in the local or the local fish region. <laughs> oh, sorry. No, go for it. Um, oh, my name is Addie. Um, I'm also in the Dr. Lamontine's lab. Um, I'm going to be working with her on her cavity nesting for the uh, I'm Zoe. Um, my advisor here is Dr. Dean, but I'm part of a program that works with the Field Museum. So my main lab is with the head of botanical collections over there, Dr. Matt von Conrad. Uh, and what I'm looking at is a bryophyte niche modeling. Essentially, we're taking small little plants like mosses. We have a bunch of occurrence records at the Field Museum. And then looking at environmental data like uh, climate, um, different kinds of land use data, and seeing if we can put that together in mapping softwares and model uh, where we can find these uh, moss species uh, scattered throughout Illinois. Um, hi everyone, I'm Carissa. Um, I work in Dr. Bell's lab and we're doing research on um, how PCBs, which are like a type of environmental contaminant, um, how they affect like inflammatory signaling within the brain. So a little more specifically, I'm looking at this one transcription factor that's involved in inflammation. Um, I'm looking at some uh, stains like brain tissue under the uh, confocal microscope and kind of using that to visualize whether or not um, the kind of you know molecules involved in that inflammation whether they become like more or less active after you know we've been exposed to PCBs and then some sort of uh, immune challenge. So Um, hi, I'm Olivia. Um, I'm a second year grad student in Dr. Brooks' lab. Um, so again, we're working with um, Eschmophilia bacteria that's really resistant to antibiotics. Um, and we're specifically looking at viruses that infected use in our lab. So if you're interested in micro uh, healthy drugs. Hi, I'm Sophia. I'm also working in Dr. Brooks' lab um, doing pretty much the same thing. So we're looking at those bacteriophages against dendrophilus mycophilia and just kind of characterizing those. And I just want to say also that not only do these graduate students do a great job of maintaining these independent projects in all of the department labs, but they also are really a really critical component of supporting student learning at DePaul. So if you haven't seen them in the classroom already, I'm sure you will see many of them in your classrooms and labs. And we really appreciate the amazing job they do balancing their teaching and research. And speaking of balancing, sometimes I'm a little off balance, I'm a little behind. So <laughs> I neglected to uh, mention our latest faculty hire, who is also a very successful DePaul master student, 
just last year. So Ed, would you like to introduce yourself? Oh, yes. um, hello, so my name is Ed Eshoo. Um, yeah, thank you for that introduction. Um, so I was a previous grad student. Um, I graduated this summer. I was working in Dr. Brooks' lab. Um, the cool thing is we have actually been working on this track of research, you, you know, looking into bacteriophages as a alternative to traditional or as an alternative to traditional antibiotic therapies. And, you know, with our other grad students, such as Lydia, her and I have been working over this past year, we've been collaborating to um, hopefully take most of my thesis research that we did for the, you know, completion of my master's, plus extra research that Lydia is doing for her own project, compiling that into a manuscript to be submitted to a peer review journal. So it's kind of a cool thing is, you know, after you go through the master's program, you can kind of, you know, hopefully see your research published. And I am now teaching um, Bio 191 Labs as a lab instructor. I am primarily teaching all three of Dr. Shermenti's labs. So I think I actually do see some of my students in here. So it's nice to see you. Thanks for coming to meet and greet. Um, I'm just happy to be a part of the, you know, DePaul faculty. You know? <laughs> So a number of student organizations also bring a lot of energy and enthusiasm and focus to our department. Um, there's one who's represented here today, and I'd like to introduce Catherine Campbell to speak about deep. Uh, here. No, oh, sorry. Do you want me to stand? I can yep. get you. So deep is to Paul's uh, ecology, uh, evolution, and physiology class. So we're a pretty professional group that. Um, I'm actually an environmental science major, so it's um, kind of combines and reaches across the difference in um, different science majors. And we look at uh, research opportunities, different job opportunities, also volunteer opportunities out of Chicago. So uh, last spring, we actually went out with uh, friends in the Chicago River and did a river cleanup day. We've gone to the Lincoln Park Conservatory, we've gone to the Chicago Lily Ponds. And um, we've also done, uh, I think I'm the, we also have done um, one part of a much larger uh, Friends of the Chicago River, River Cleanup Day. Um, and so it's just a way to find the different uh, volunteer opportunities, also job opportunities, um, and share and connect you know, each other with different research opportunities and internships. Um, so if you want to, Join or have any questions, you can email me, it's up on there, or um, Dr. Lama Dane is the club advisor, so you can always ask her for uh, more information about you. Okay. And then even though some of these other organizations weren't able to join us and be represented today, um, I just wanted to mention, so I've been in touch with Dr. Bistriansky, who is the faculty advisor for the Pre-Vet and Animology Club, and he ensures me that they're busy this quarter. Um, Dr. Lamartan again works with DEEP. Um, Dr. Kozlowski works with the Neuroscience Club. Dr. Sandy Virtue and Psychology works with NeuroSci, which is the Neuro Honor Society group. Um, and all of those student groups are active and looking for new members. Um, I am actually the faculty advisor for Global Brigades, which is a group of students that sends students to various, uh, primarily countries in Central and South America, but also they've taken trips to Africa as well, um, to kind of work with local communities to establish better public health clinics to help improve their water infrastructure. Each brigade kind of has its own focus. Um, so they've done a number of trips in the past to places like Honduras, Nicaragua, Ghana. Unfortunately, as you can imagine, over the pandemic, there wasn't a lot of opportunity for that kind of travel. Um, so over the last couple of years, unfortunately, a lot of the senior membership of this group has since graduated, um, but they're our alumni who really want to see it get up and running again. And I know there's a lot of interest in the group, uh, but there's currently not an active leadership. So if any of you guys think this is something you'd be interested in getting more involved with, please reach out to me, let me know. I can put you in touch with the National Global Bays Organization. I can put you in touch with the former um, DePaul officers and obviously support you myself as you sort of revive this group and get it back up and running. And then I just want to mention, I know Dr. Sparks said at the beginning that we've got you. 
it's true. Not only do we have you, the college has you, the university has you. There's a lot of support infrastructure in place. Um, these are just some, not all, of some of the resources that DePaul has for students that find themselves in a place where they need some extra support, whether that's academic support, financial support, emotional support, um, psychological support. Um, so I would encourage you guys again to make use as needed of all the resources DePaul has in place to support your success. Um, and also in addition to the labs that talked about all of their projects that are ongoing and many of which are interested in taking on new undergrads, I just wanted to let you know that there are lots of opportunities that DePaul organizes or that DePaul organizes in collaboration with other uh, undergraduate institutions in the area for undergraduates not only to do research, but to get experience presenting their research, whether that's as in the form of a talk, in the form of a poster. Um, so the research showcase happens at DePaul every year, and it's a great way to get your first experience presenting your work. It doesn't have to be published. It doesn't have to be final. Put together a poster on what you've done so far and get a chance to speak with other students and faculty about it. Um, the Chicago Area Undergraduate Research Symposium is another annual event that's a great one that brings together students from all over the Chicago area and it's primarily student organized and driven and then they recruit faculty to come and see the posters and talks and give some feedback. Uh, so that's a great event every year. So these are some other things you can look forward to if you do get involved in research. And then also there's a number of different um, scholarship and fellowship opportunities available both internal to DePaul and external to DePaul if you're looking for a way to support your research and make it sort of a, a job as well as a learning experience. And then I'll let Jamie talk to you a little bit about social media and also about herself. <laughs> <laughs> Within reason, I suppose. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm currently the Assistant Director of Academic Advising for Biological Sciences. Um, I am sad and excited to say that I will be beginning a new role with the university um, two Mondays from now, I will be the Neuroscience Program Success Coordinator. Um, so I will still be around, but I will no longer be formally academic advising. Um, we have a wonderful CSH advising office on the fourth floor of McGowan North. Lauren Paez will be taking over advising biology students while they hire a full-time replacement for this position. Um, any of you that are in Pathways Honors are already advised by Lauren if you're a biology Pathways student. So now everybody will be advised by her. So um, it's been great getting to know some of you and you're gonna be in great hands going forward. Enough about me. <laughs> um, we do have, um, we've got uh, our DePaul Bio uh, Facebook page. Um, more so lately, though, the student workers have kind of um, navigated us, geared us more towards the Twitter and Instagram, because I think that's where you guys are a little more. So we're just going to keep following you to wherever you go to, <laughs> to give you important information. Um, we've got our LinkedIn page as well. Um, and then you should have been receiving from me the weekly BioBlast email. That's one of the best places to get your consistent info. Um, so anything that's sent to me um, in terms of opportunities for research, grad programs, uh, jobs, internships, all sorts of stuff like that, I put in there. And then I also always have some of the most important student support resources. So things like Dean of Students Office, um, TA uh, tutoring hours, um, supplemental instruction, uh, on and on and on. There's so many different resources that I, it's hard to even compile them all in one place. So uh, just keep an eye on your DePaul email because even once I transition into my new role and, and my replacement comes in, you'll still be getting that weekly bio blast email with all that great information. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Thank you so much, Carolyn. Thanks everyone. And I just have one last slide. Shameless plug as again organizer of the seminar committee or organizer of the seminar series. Um, this is our draft calendar for this coming year. Um, we've got our dates set for the fall. Some of them are a little bit fluid for winter and spring, uh, but we have many of our speakers set already. Um, we have kind of three uh, main aims of our seminar series. One is to bring in people to talk about their research programs and their ongoing um, publications. Another one is to allow students to see how faculty got where they are 
and the challenges they encountered on the way and how they overcame those kinds of obstacles that they met. Um, so that's our journey series. So that's a little bit more about my story versus my research. Um, and Dr. Aguirre is gonna be your journey speaker for the fall. And they have one of those each quarter as well. And then just this year, uh, we're also including a new uh, sub series called Perspectives, which is designed to expose students to some of the variety of careers that you can move into once you've gotten a degree in the sciences. Um, so we have a science journalist coming in, we have someone from CDM coming in who's a bioinformaticist, um, and a faculty member from the psychology department who actually researches how um, certain strategies benefit minorities in STEM education. So I hope you'll be able to join us for some of these as well. And these will also be advertised broadly on social media too. Dr. Sparks, did you want to say anything else in closing or? Blue shorts. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Down doors, cookies and drinks, but mostly blue shorts. Thank you all so much. Hopefully you've got a sense of the kind of enthusiasm and energy that exists in our department, the excitement around the kind of things that we do, the unbelievable number of programs. If you just have to kind of decide for yourself what is it you want to do, we're going to help you get there, support you to get there. Like we said, we got you, colleges got you, universities got you. You don't feel overwhelmed. You don't feel like it's too much. You don't feel stressed. We got you. We're going to take care of you all the way through. And you have an amazing experience. So get your free shirts. Talk to all of us. Welcome again.